Back in single variable calculus, probably one of the very first things you learned about integrals is that they can be used to calculate the area under a curve. In a very similar fashion, a double integral can be used to find the three-dimensional volume under a surface. And the usual way we evaluate a double integral is by doing two integrals one after another, in a construction called an iterated integral, where you take an integral of an integral. That may sound kind of scary, but if you think about it, it might make some surface level sense. I mean, if one integral gives you area, then it kind of makes sense that going up one dimension from area to volume would involve doing one more integral somehow. But why is this integral of an integral construction the right way to do it? And how do you know how to set one up, anyway? What is each piece of this double integral really doing under the hood, so to speak? Well, here's one way to think about it. If you've taken calculus before, you might already have some practice finding volumes just using a single integral. This was the process of finding a volume by cross-sections, and it basically worked like this. If you have a solid whose slices, or cross-sections, along a particular axis all have a certain regular shape, like a square for instance, you could compute the volume of the solid by first finding a formula that computes the area of any particular slice located at any given point. This formula would be a function of whichever variable's axis is perpendicular to the slices, basically giving you a way to label every single slice with its position along a certain axis. You can then compute the volume of the solid by integrating this area function along the axis the slices are located. The visual I keep in my head for this process is taking a slice and moving it along the axis while it sweeps out the resulting solid. So that's volume by cross-sections in a nutshell, and we only needed one integral to do it. So why do we even need to bring double integrals into this? Well, remember that this strategy requires us to find an area formula for an arbitrary slice of the solid across some axis. And in your past, you probably only dealt with solids whose slices were familiar shapes, like rectangles, triangles, or semicircles, all of which have pretty straightforward area formulas. But what if I gave you a solid whose slices look like parabolas? There's no quick and dirty formula to compute the area under a parabola, but we still know how to do it. You take an integral of the function describing the parabola. So to use volume by cross-sections here, the area formula for a slice is itself an integral. In this case, it will be an integral in y because our slices are parallel to the y-axis. But note that this integral should also contain the variable x as well. This is because the shape of a slice also depends on where along the x-axis the slice is located. Change the x value, and you change the y function that needs to be integrated to get its cross-sectional area. So we end up with this nested double integral expression for the volume, where we first have to compute the inner integral to find the proper area formula of an arbitrary slice. And then we take an outer integral in order to have that slice kind of sweep out the corresponding volume of the solid we're interested in. So this, then, is the visual I keep in my mind when I think about what a double integral is doing. The inner integral is responsible for sweeping out an arbitrary slice of the solid along a certain axis. If the inner integral is a y-integral, you sweep along the y-direction. If the inner integral is an x-integral, you sweep along the x-direction. Once this is done, the outer integral is responsible for taking the slice and sweeping it along the other axis in order to carve out the solid whose volume you want. Also note that the bounds of each integral reflect the extents of the sweeping motions in each direction. For example, if the inner integral is a y-integral like it is here, the bounds indicate what portion of the y-axis should be swept to produce a slice. In this case, any given y-slice should be swept starting from y equals negative 3 and ending at y equals 2. After this, the bounds of the outer x-integral indicate the portion of the x-axis that the slice should be swept between to carve out the solid. In this case, the y-slice should be swept along the x-direction starting from x equals negative 2 and ending at x equals positive 2. Alright, so this works, but actually, it can sometimes happen that the bounds for these double integrals can be a bit more complicated. You see, using only constant bounds 
a double integral can only sweep out solids whose base is a rectangular region of the xy plane, restricting us to solids which look like a box with a curvy top. This is because the two-dimensional slices the inner integral produces all have the same extents, y equals negative 3 and y equals 2 in this case. But what if you want to find the volume of a solid whose base isn't just a simple rectangle? Take, for example, this solid. Its base in the xy plane is the region bounded by a line segment on the bottom and a parabola on top. How do we set up a double integral here? Think back again to how volume by cross-sections worked. We first need to find a formula to compute the area of an arbitrary slice of the solid across some axis. This is the job of our inner integral. In this case, the region looks like it's easiest to slice along the y direction, since the two bounding curves seem to naturally describe a floor and ceiling as opposed to two walls. To compute the area of one of these slices, we use a single integral, the inner integral. But unlike before, the bounds of the integral will depend on which slice we're looking at. For example, if we're looking at this slice here, its lower and upper bounds are y equals negative 0.75 and y equals positive 1.12, respectively. But if we look at this other slice over here, it has lower and upper bounds y equals negative 1.5 and y equals 0. What this means is that the bounds of our inner integral will themselves be functions of the outer variable, in this case x, since the width of each slice depends on its x location. So instead of having two constants, c and d, as the bounds of our inner integral, we'll have two functions of x. And these functions come from the equations that describe the bounding curves, the line segment and the parabola. In this case, since we're interested in knowing the y extents of a slice as a function of x, we need to express both the upper and lower curves in the form y equals some function of x. Now, in an actual problem, you might have to figure out what these formulas are based on whatever the mathematical description of the solid is, but we won't get into that for now. For this video, I'll just give away that the formula for the line here is y equals negative a half x minus 1, and the formula for the parabola is y equals negative a half x squared minus a half x plus 1. Plug these in as your inner integration bounds, and we have a full description of the area of any slice of the solid given its x position. Okay, now to complete the process of volume by cross sections, we need to set up the bounds of the outer integral. And here, we don't have to do anything fancy with variable bounds. We just plug in the leftmost x position of the region and the rightmost x position of the region as our lower and upper bounds of the outer integral. As for what these bounds actually are, I'll once again just give it away that these bounds happen to be x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2 in this case. But again, in an actual problem, you may have to figure those out on your own. And so there we have it. This double integral computes the volume of the original solid we started with. And again, remember you can think of the inner integral as sweeping out an arbitrary slice of the solid, and the outer integral as sweeping the slice to carve out the solid.